So my name is Reverend Lin <clears throat> Leonard McElveen, and I'm the Vice President of Ministries here at Mel Trotter Ministries. And I want to bring you a message today that is part two of what we talked about last week, which is uh, last week we talked about the fact that <clears throat> to make it through life, you have to develop some sort of fight. The problem is, is you got to know what to fight and you got to know what not to fight. And most of the time when we think about fights, we think about the external things that we're fighting against. And yes, somehow, sometimes you actually do have to fight those things as well. But there's also an internal fight that we have to have. And sometimes if we're not really successful with the internal fight, we're not going to be successful with the external fight. And so the thing that we have to fight is the desires okay that we are that happen from the inside so what james says in his books is that you desire but you do not have and so then you get really upset because you can't get your desires filled and then we have one person with one set of desires somebody else with a little bit different set of desires and many times what we're experiencing in life especially in relationships is these desires conflicting with each other. And so this actually leads us sometimes to what I call a low level, low grade suffering, a low level, low grade dissatisfaction. And sometimes these things are suppressed. And so we're not really noticing that level of fight that's going on with our desires, what we notice more is the conflicts that we're having with other people. So what I want to do today is say to you is that, first of all, wherever you are, that God knows where you're at and that God understands where you're at. And the only thing that we can do is to own where we're at. We, you know, the scripture says if you confess, okay, if we bring it to the surface, if we bring it out from under suppression, it's not saying that we will have success, but we have a better opportunity at success when we know exactly what it is that we are fighting. So it's important to fight, but it's more important to fight the right thing. So I am my own worst enemy, okay? Every bad decision I've ever made, I made it. Oh yes, there were other people involved. Yes, there were circumstances that were involved. There were all kinds of things that were involved. And I'm not saying that those things didn't contribute, but I am the only consistent one that was always involved, even when the circumstances change, even when the people change and even when the places thing changed. I am the consistent one that was always there. So there's a fight that needs to happen on the inside of me before I can even begin to fight what's outside. Okay, so I'm not saying that there's not an outside fight, because there is. I'm not saying that traumatic things don't happen, because they do. I'm not saying that horrible incidences don't occur because they actually do. I'm just saying that as long as you're trying to fight those incidences, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get to the root problem that actually could be causing those incidences to occur or causing me to respond or react to them in a way that is not beneficial for me and actually affects me in a very, very negative fashion. And then at some point, I'm fighting everything on the outside, okay? And I'm not fighting the stuff that's going on inside of myself. So, grace, God's grace. I want you to know that grace is there for you no matter where you find yourself today. That God's grace is available to you no matter what fight you find yourself in. If you're in an external fight today, I want you to know that grace is available for you. 
if you're in a fight with your past or you're in a fight with the people that you're currently in relationship with grace is there for you if you're in a fight with simply being in this place and all the struggles that actually come from being in a place where one person's got one set of desires and another person's got another set of desires and somebody over here got contrary desires to that and all this conflict that's happening because we are human beings I want you to know that grace is here for you today as a matter of fact the writer James says it this way in the fourth chapter, verse six. He says, but he gives more grace. So God will give you the sufficient amount of grace for the situation that you find yourself in. And you have to start off by believing that, accepting that, receiving that. I want you to know that God loves you he loves you just the way that you are. Whatever it is that you're going through today, I'm here to tell you the good news. And the good news is that God is not angry with you. Even when you experience a low grade of suffering, or even if you experience a higher grade of suffering, I want you to know that God loves you. Now, the suffering will say to you that God doesn't the suffering will say that God doesn't care. The suffering will make you question God. And the suffering will make you question yourself. And the suffering will make you question the people around you. You can get to a point where your suffering is so intense that you even question the people that are trying to help you. Okay? So... I'm saying that in spite of all of these things, no matter where you find yourself on the spectrum, I want you to know that he gives more grace. And that's why the scripture says this, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Now, the proud are people that say, well, this is just the way that I am, and this is the way I'm going to stay. And I would like to ask you this question. If you are experiencing some level of dissatisfaction, some level of low-grade suffering, some level of despair and hopelessness, despair says it doesn't matter what I do, it's not going to change anything anyway. If you are experiencing this today, do you really want to stay there? Or let me ask you a, a deeper question. Do you want it to get worse than it is today? Because if you maintain your pride, which is, here's what I think about it. Here's what I feel about it. Here's what my experiences are with it. And then you come to conclusions about yourself because of your own thinking, your own experiences, your own understanding your own knowledge, that is a form of pride. And what I'm saying is this, do you want to live with that for the rest of your life? It says, but God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So when I am experiencing dissatisfaction, when I'm experiencing depression, when I'm experiencing all the things that life can throw at us, and sometimes it throws it at us because of what other people have done to us, and sometimes it throws it at us because of my reaction to what other people have done to me, and sometimes it throws it at us because of the places that I've been, and in this place, the only thing you can pick up is a low level of suffering because I have lived in the village of low grade suffering, or maybe I lived in a village of high grade suffering, but I only came down with low grade suffering. Okay, and maybe I picked that up in a place, 
okay, are maybe because of the things that have happened to me or I had or someone gave to me or someone gave to me in an inheritance. You know, you can inherit things from your parents. You can inherit things from your relatives. You can inherit things from your friends. Maybe I got an inheritance of something that just not working out. Do you want to stay there is my question. Do you like living there? Well, pride says, I don't know. I'll try to figure it out on my own. Humility says, you know what? I need to own this. I'm not quite sure who was responsible, but somehow I picked up this along the way. So it says he shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And the scripture says he will lift you up in due time. And then verse 7 in James says it this way. Submit yourselves then to God. So I need to give God my suffering. I need to give God my inheritance. I need to give God my reaction to it all. I need to give God my desires. Because sometimes it was my desires that actually got me into the situation that I find myself in. Not all the time. But sometimes it was my own desires that looked so different when I had them. But then they turned into something different when they manifested themselves. And I don't even understand how I got here. Because when I got into this, it didn't look like this at all. Okay, so I've got to submit my desires to God. It says submit yourselves. i got to give him myself. And listen, that's grace. Grace is I can come to him with anything. I don't have to clean myself up first. I don't have to get myself together. I don't have to fix my thinking. I don't have to make my experiences today so much better than they were in the past before I can come to him. No, he says, come as you are because I love you. And I love you with an everlasting love. I love you. You are the apple of my eye. Okay? And your experiences will say to you, no, you're not the apple of his eye. Your experiences will say to you, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. God, you know, he, he, he doesn't want anything to do with you whatsoever. So submit yourself. Let's give him our experiences. Let's give him our thoughts. Let's give him our understanding. Let's give him our feelings. Let's give him everything that has made us into whatever we happen to be today. And then it says, and it seems kind of weird, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And it is a lack of resistance to the devil himself when we believe that we have the capacity to fulfill our own lives all by ourselves. That's what he told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. All you got to do is eat from this tree. Listen, you don't need to lose something. What you need to do is add something. OK, and most of us think if we could just add something to our lives, that we would get ourselves out of the situation that we're in. And this scripture clearly says you need to resist that idea. You need to resist that thought. You need to resist that feeling. And once you resist that thought, resist that feeling, resist that kind of thinking, and resist the inheritance that you picked up somewhere along the way, whether you got it from people or whether you got it from places or whether you got it from things. It says, then he'll flee from you. And the reason the devil don't go is because we give him ground interiorly. We give him ground to stand on 
and fight us from the inside out. And you don't want to create a groundwork on your interior that makes it easy for the devil to step in right in the middle of your heart, right, right in the middle of your life, and take a stand against you. Okay? And then the scripture says in verse 8, come near to God, and he'll come near to you. And God is always close to the humble. That's why he says, humble yourself. He resists the proud, but he, 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 he is always near to those who humble themselves and say these simple words. God, I've tried to do this on my own. It's not working. I've tried to maintain my life on my own. It's not working. I tried to maintain the things that I picked up from my parents, from my friends, from the places that I've been in, from the people that I've known. I've tried that and it's not working. I need you. I need you, and I need something new. I don't need a better and more improved version of what I was yesterday. I need a whole new life, okay? That's humility. So it says that, come near to God. And listen, if you come near to God, he'll come near to you. The problem is not that God is not present, but it's all of my internal stuff that I picked up along the way that's occupying a space that actually belongs to God. God is present right now. We just can't sense him because of all the thinking that's going on in our heads, okay? All the feelings that we're experiencing in our hearts. We're blocking him out with our own drama. And it could be a drama that I simply, I got someplace else. I don't even know how I got this drama. All I know is, is right now, I'm, it's causing me to suffer. So it's not that God is not present. We aren't present. And the reason we're not present is because our past and our experiences and everything that we've gone through is robbing us of the opportunity to be present. So, it says, come near to God, he'll come near to you. And then he says, wash your hands. So one of the things that we learned during the pandemic was that it was important to wash our hands, that we had to spend a lot of times washing our hands. And what were we washing our hands from? All the germs that like are everywhere. And I want you to know that this stuff that I've experienced in my past, the stuff that I've been through, it's like germs, okay? I got germs along the way. And then those germs, if they're not taken care of, th th those germs will cause a low level of suffering. Okay, so he says, wash your hands, all you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. The reason why we get double-minded is because we pick up a toxin. And the toxin makes us two people. The toxins actually begin to split us. Because we were made to be one way by God, but the toxins have actually made us into another person. So the toxins of my past, the toxins of the way I was raised, the toxins of my own thinking, my own thinking has split me and made me into a whole different person than the person that I was created to be. And then it says something that doesn't make a lot of sense at all. It says, grieve and mourn. And grieve and mourn over what? Grieve and mourn over this person that I have been made into. There is something to fight. And there is something to grieve over. 
Now, you don't grieve over things. It's not the loss. There is something to lose. What I need to lose is what I've been made into. Whether I did it or somebody else did it. Whether it happened externally or whether it is happening right now internally. There is something to grieve over and there's something to mourn over. And then he says, and well, and this is what people always did at funerals. And what I'm saying to you is that there's a part of your life that needs to die. There's a part of your life that needs to be grieved over. There's a part of your life that needs to be said goodbye to. There is a part of your life needs to be mourned but you can't mourn something that you're still holding on to so are you willing to let go of yourself the way that you are what you've become are you willing to grieve over that because I'm telling you right now there will be a grieving period if you choose to let go God's grace is there for you every step of the way and God will lift you up if you allow him to help you die okay and I know this is very very difficult to do so I'm gonna challenge you that if you're listening to this Think yeah, that makes a little bit of sense, but I'm not sure if I can let go. I challenge you to get together with one of our chaplains here at Mel Charter Ministries or meet with our triage staff so that you can start that process of grieving and mourning and letting a part of your life die. Now, when you start letting a part of your life die, please don't go and resurrect it. Okay? Because some people start on a path of grieving and mourning and the grieving and the mourning and the wailing is just too much so they go back and pick up the same old thing and then they come to a conclusion i don't need to let this part of me die i just need to figure out how to make it better listen you've already tried that i don't know how many times we've all tried that at what point do you come to a conclusion that this is not going to work i need to be new because for new things to happen to me, I got to be new. For new experiences to happen to me, I got to be new. For me to be able to meet new people who are not like those people that I knew in the past, I got to become new. Listen, these people are not making you new. God is the only one that can make you new. And until you're made new, nothing new can happen. Absolutely nothing. So we're not resurrecting, okay? We're not like improving. We're not changing the past. We're actually allowing ourselves to die. And then you get grief. And then you get mourning. And then you get something new that was way better than anything that has ever happened to you before. All right, I challenge you to pray with me about this today. So if you are experiencing low grade suffering or just plain old dissatisfaction or despair and hopelessness where you've pretty much thought about it and you wrote yourself off, okay? Or you wrote yourself into the wrong story and then that story didn't work out. I want to pray with you. So Lord, we give ourselves to you. And we submit ourselves to you. We humble ourselves before you. We want new life that only can be given to us by your son. And I thank you, Lord, for the grace that comes from him because he's already paid the price for my low-grade suffering. He's already paid the price for the dissatisfaction that all of us experience in life. He's already paid the price for all the things that have happened to me. 
He's already paid the price for all of my reactions to the things that have happened. He's already paid the price for the damage that has happened in this world that causes all of us to get infections, spiritual infections, mental infections, physical infections. Lord, you've already paid the price for it all. Help us to surrender ourselves to you and then allow you to kill off the old life so that we can be made brand new. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.